after the seven panelists. So welcome to, to this session on education and training, uh, which is tackling uh, another angle of, uh, of the story that we have been developing uh, today in, in the conference. Um, uh, indeed, we, we have heard a lot about uh, the, the skills gap and, and the lack of uh, youngsters' interest in uh, on digital careers. Uh, for well, uh, for our kids, uh, uh, and I have two two, two daughters. Uh, internet is today uh, a, a commodity, and uh, they tend to to make a, a use of it, which is uh, predominantly uh, ludic, or or let's say uh, use it for for their leisure time, and. Um, uh, what about uh, the use of those competencies for, for jobs? Uh, we, um, well, myself, uh, I'm represent Telecentre Europe, which is uh, an organization uh, dealing with uh, ICT learning centers. Uh, and uh, we um, are running a, a self-assessment tool, which is called Skillage, which uh, allowed us to make a, a small study a couple of years ago, and it showed that uh, in the field in which uh, uh, the, the youngsters were failing more was in, in productivity uh, with their uh, digital competencies. Uh, there is also uh, extensive discussions uh, about uh, what uh, it's called uh, the digital, being digital native, being uh, already born in the digital era. And uh, uh, many arguing uh, that uh, there is still uh, a digital gap even in, in, in the, uh, between the youngster populations. So um, on the other side, I would say that uh, we have been taken uh, by surprise uh, for this uh, very rapid phenomenon of uh, internet evolving so fast since it was uh, commercially launched a couple of decades ago until now. So uh, today we, we start to see many examples of uh, new ways of working. Uh, indeed, uh, the parallelization to this one, it's exploring that field. And uh, also examples in which, uh, uh, let's say, the traditional uh, way of structuring a, an enterprise uh, are ch changing dramatically, where people is uh, inventing uh, their, their own role. So. Um, what uh, we intend to do uh, in, in, in this session is to explore uh, how uh, all these shifts are, let's say, uh, tackled uh, from the education uh, side, and how uh, or which are the good uh, technology-driven um, uh, innovation examples in education that can be inspiring for us to think on, on, on all the challenges we are facing uh, in Europe, as uh, has been described in, in the previous sessions, and um, and, and this uh, comes in, in times where uh, uh, the ha habits of the society are changing, and especially youngsters, uh, they are really driven by by motivation. So uh, it's really uh, challenging for for teachers to keep uh, them engaged when they they have, uh, let's say. Uh, more limited uh, command of uh, technology than uh, than the youngsters themselves. Um, so, um, saying that as a kind of introduction, uh, and indeed to start setting up the scene and, uh, and hearing about uh, good examples coming from the educational system itself, I would like to invite uh, to stage to Mark Durando, who is a uh, the managing director of European Schoolnet, and uh, uh, well, the executive director, and he has over 20 years of experience in the uh, education and training field, uh, working first in continuing education uh, for enterprises, then moving to uh, uh, technical assistance offices uh, of uh, European programs, and. Uh, with lots of experience in European cooperation. Since uh, 2006, uh, Mark is uh, joined uh, the, the European School Net Network, uh, which uh, it's a group in uh, ministries of education for, for, from all U uh, Europe. So uh, Mark, uh, please help us uh, delucidating which are the good stories 
in this topic. Do you want uh, the microphone? Yes. Or, yes. Or you can put it so it works this way. Yes. Good afternoon, all of you. Uh, I have been asked in the, for this panel to share with you how formal education uh, systems can engage learners to, to develop their skills better and more. And that's always a challenge with the C-Skills Week events. Because the last one was in Roma a couple of months ago. And uh, we always have to innovate because we can't say the same thing at each conference. But on the other side, we can't change a picture, habits, culture, ways of learning, ways of engaging so quick. So for those, for those who now have the habits to be with all these type of European events, please apologize if I'm using some slides I used already in Roma at the last Eskils conference. Uh, very quickly, because I know we, we're short on time, uh, I like, before I, I, I present what formal education systems are doing, I think that's important to, to, to raise some education issues on where we are and what's the context. And, and currently, we have an education and employability issues. And that's a, a real element which has to be taken in, into account. One in four students are early school leavers. That's the situation in Europe. Forty of them do not find a job. One in five young people are unemployed. And we know that there are around 500,000 ICT jobs which are not filled in. One of the key success indicators is how can we make the bridge between this unemployed with plenty of potential anyway and these jobs which are not filled in. The second issue is more linked to capacity building and professional development of teachers. So we have to support teachers regarding their IT skills as well. We really have to work and there is a key issue that everybody has to keep in mind with regard to formal education systems. Young teachers entering into the profession, quite a lot of them are leaving the profession after less than three years. And the second aspect which has to be taken into account, the IT skills teachers are not the young ones, which is quite important to keep in mind. The, second, the, the third aspect is digital competence and the digital divide. And I will present you very quickly a couple of slides. Use of technology in schools from few times to more or less never. And that's the result of a randomized survey we launched for the commission. Which means the current practice actually in schools, in classes, is for more or less approaching once a week for two countries or only approaching several times a month. So that's quite important to know what the situation is in all our European countries. And that's a study, 190,000 students have been interviewed, as well as more than 20,000 teachers and head of school. And if you continue on that, student use of resources, when they use technology in classes, that's only for using classic PowerPoints. Not using very, elaborated data logging things or simulation or games and so on. That's the situation we have. Last element is, which comes as a very good surprise, meaning that the momentum is there. More than 70% of teachers do take continuing professional development activities outside of any formal in-service training scheme on their own time. So that's a sort of situation which is important to share. Uh, also, regarding the situation of digital competence, we have to keep in mind the last results of the ICILS study, which revealed that in nine European countries, for an age range of 15 years old, more than 29% of students, even if they are consumers of technology, they don't master basic IT skills. So they're interested to use technology, but they don't have a clue or they are not enough prepared to master these IT skills and they don't have the appropriate level of competence on it. So our formal education systems can engage learners and that's only ideas, thoughts and some elements quickly to share with you. The needs for raising awareness through this e-skills campaign but also to target it to special focus for teachers, head of schools, and guidance counselors. Certainly, we have to continue that, and that's what we already do. 
curriculum and continuing professional development for STEM teachers globally. I will not go into detail and I will only present a result of a study we made regarding more coding. And finally, multi-stakeholder partnerships. That's a, this event is a typical result of how multi-stakeholder cooperation can really support the development of the e-skills agenda. So we launched uh, four or five months ago a survey because everybody was doing the buzz to say, coding in schools, uh, you have to do things, you, we have to launch it. But that's the case. We, we worked with 20 other ministries on regarding what the situation. Out of these 20 ministries, we have 12 countries already integrated coding in their curriculum, already put into place quite a lot of uh, initiatives supporting a continuing professional development for their teachers. I'll give you some example of England, Estonia, Ireland, Lithuania, Portugal, and Finland will launch a program for school, primary school children from 2016. So that's what is currently into place. So for, for one time, ministries do not lag behind. They are very, very active as well regarding how to take on board the e-skills challenges and how to introduce coding in the curriculum. And that's an answer of formal education systems. I do not mention all the other countries which are about to do that. I'm only mentioning here the countries which, where it's already in place. And I heard that Latvia has already made some things that has been mentioned, so that's not exhaustive, that's only a snapshot of what could be done. The second type of things, what our formal education can do, uh, we are represent network of Ministry of Education and we support them on innovative approaches. And uh, as an example, we discussed around lunchtime on this grand coalition for ICT job. Uh, we, were, we made a pledge uh, one year and a half ago, globally, and the pledge was to test the capacity of massive online training for supporting teachers in their professional development activities. So we invested. So that's not an activity that we recycled. That's an activity that we really created we invested our own money with no support and we created the concept of the European School Net Academy providing teachers with specific uh, activities. To give you an example, uh, we launched around uh, five courses online. So that's mass MOOCs, TOOCs for targeted, whatever you call them. But 10,000 teachers already registered and followed the course. And you really see that uh, we have courses linked to innovative STEM teaching, how to teach computing for secondary teachers. We will have courses coming in on how to teach computing for primary uh, teachers as well. So it's all related to increase the competence of teachers so they c can take on board the e-skills challenges. So that's type of formal answers that our ministries together try to put into place. Of course, we limit it for the time being by localization because everything is run into English. We arrive to more than 10,000 teachers registered following the courses with a retention rate of more than 40%, which is much better than for any higher education offer. But now we're working with the ministries to find a way to localize it. So that's the type of things we are currently doing. So the last aspect I'd like to share with you is a, a, a EU coding initiative, which also we decided within the Grand Coalition to launch between our ministries as well as the support of industry. We have four companies supporting us on it. We have Facebook, we have SAP, we have Liberty Global and Microsoft. And what we tried to do is to really provide an umbrella for promoting and scaling up existing initiative, supporting teachers and students facilitating dialogue with stakeholders and also trying to reach out even more. Of course, in Roma, I mentioned a major point of consistency on what we do. There are so many initiatives, but we don't have to forget that the e-skills dossier and the IT dossier is a subset of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And all what has to be done also is to find a consistent approach because with not enough good background in STEM, you will never train highly skilled professionals in the e-skills area. 
Thank you for your attention. Big applause for I'm on Thank time. you. Yeah, perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Can you take your seat here? Thank you. So, please join. So, uh, I will invite uh, now uh, to uh, leave uh, from uh, the Commission. She recently moved from education and culture to uh, the um, employment uh, um, DG, uh, where the skills and mobility dossier was uh, added uh, to, 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 the, to the DG mission. And uh, she has a, a, well, a very long uh, lasting experience in the commission. She joined the, the commission 28 years ago. Uh, she worked in the information society uh, um, DG uh, around thematic, telematics for education and training, uh, and DG research. And, and, and lastly, in education and culture before joining uh, DC uh, employment recently. And uh, she uh, specialized in skills development, uh, validation of non-formal and informal learning, and uh, in, in competency frameworks. And indeed, uh, um, when we speak about digital competencies, what, we are, we, what are we speaking about exactly? Okay, thanks. In complement to what um, has been, been said before around formal education, I would like to stress next to formal education also the education and training sectors that uh, look into uh, skills development, competence development, and uh, training that is not always uh, embedded in formal education, training that is offered by a lot of instances. And I come like that very much into the lifelong learning education. We have heard this morning that there is an enormous mismatch between what comes out of all those education, training, upskilling initiatives and actions, and what is needed by industry in order that an individual can find a job. And I want especially to address that mismatch between education and, in fact, being employed at the industry. And when we look to that skills mismatch, and that is one of the reasons why uh, the portfolio of uh, our Commissioner Mayan Thesen on DG employment was enlarged with skills, and that many of my colleagues uh, moved from DG education to DG employment, um, we are looking into those competence developments that can try to fill up that mismatch. But of course, skills development, whoever, however did this takes place, cannot be uh, the solution if you don't have instances or organizations or institutions that build the bridge. And I want uh, instruments that make the language between those two much more clear. And that is the, the enormous task uh, to be taken and to try to find which are the uh, brokerage mechanisms, which are the instruments that can build that bridge between those two instances. And there you get, of course, close to what employment services, public and private, is their task. They have to guide, they have to help an individual looking for a job, a youngster coming out of education or uh, even an older worker, and to link it up to the uh, job needs that are there. And out of experience, the language between those two worlds is very difficult. And it are in the uh, brokerage mechanisms that you try to bridge uh, those languages. Now, in the digital area, uh, a while ago, we have tried to come up with a kind of uh, description, identification of what does make an individual, a citizen, a learner, digital savvy. 
I'm not talking here about being an ICT professional, just in life, coming out of a certain education pathway, what, how digital savvy are you? If you are a teacher, what do you know about digital competences? And uh, we have tried to put that into a framework. Because uh, the key message is we must find very quickly uh, really a solution uh, to uh, overcome that mismatch and to try uh, to fill that gap because uh, the digital transformation is really getting uh, hard and this in all sectors which means that in fact all our citizens have not only to be a bit digital literate but being digital competent. And if you look to the skills requirements, they need all to be a bit digital competent. So what do we are expecting in general uh, of our learners, of our citizens in that sense? And uh, we know that in formal education and training, and we, heur we hear often the, the cry out education has to do, uh, to do something, this will require time. Things are happening, but these are structural changes. But what can we do now? That's in, in fact uh, the big questions. We know that those skills are not there. Um, we know uh, that... Um, those skills have to come in and have to be trained, but what kind of skills and how can they be trained? And what we do know also is that a lot of that learning takes place informal and non-formal. And then you get in the huge problem of there is no recognition, there's no assessment. Uh, if you are an individual, how can you show on your CV or to an employer that you do have digital competences, what do you need to show and so on. And uh, uh, what we know is that the education and training is not providing that and, and uh, your barometer survey showed which in skills mostly are provided by education and training and you see there on science and technology only 26% only of the people um, uh, who have filled the your barometer found that those skills are being trained in formal education and training and in fact the rest is done outside in an informal and non-formal way. Even, and there is a huge discrepancy between uh, the countries, some countries say okay education and training are doing a good job but quite some uh, countries are also saying that is not the case and that in fact uh, the skills that are acquired outside the formal education you see there uh, the languages but you see also there uh, quite some uh, important skills as problem solving, working with others, skills that are called soft skills skills, but also science and technology are uh, skills that seem to come out much more, are learned in other ways and through formal education and training. And that's important to know and we need to be able to catch that and to pass this on to the employers who are looking for people who have certain skills. For example, uh, the youth area is enormously interested in trying to be able to catch the digital competences that is acquired through a lot of initiatives in youth work, uh, in voluntary work and so on. And it is quite a highly political uh, debate that is taking place. Um, what has been done, and that's what I wanted to show you, but I go very quickly through uh, the, the transparencies, is that we have tried to catch what are now the sub-competences of what is meant to be digital competent. What does it mean to be digital savvy as a normal citizen? not as an ICT professional, but what do, you, what do you need to do? Not in terms of applications or tools, but in terms of competences, in order that education and training can try to put these in the learning outcomes and is able then to assess it. That was the goal about it. And I have to say, digital competences are not pure ICT functional skills. They are much broader in definition and they are, in fact it is the communicative, 
critical collaborative use of ICT in daily life. It is really the uh, using the tools to function, to work and to learn in life. And when you look to digital competence in that sense, many more competence areas are coming in than just the basic ICT functional skills. And here you have the five competence areas that have been identified and you see uh, things like safety, problem solving, uh, content creation, co-creation being very important. I have here two examples of uh, definition. So under each of the five domains, there have been competences identified, like under communication, one of the competences, uh, 2.3, is engaging in online citizenship with a clear description uh, that is being done. Or, for example, under problem solving, one of the problem solving competences is innovating, creating and solving using digital tools with a much more uh, explicit uh, description. These sub-competences have not been developed, are not coming from the sky. Of course, a huge amount of stakeholders going over thousand people, experts in the field, ministries of education, uh, employers have been involved. And the framework is in fact a duration of a very serious platform of discussion and work done. But it's not meant to be a standard, it's meant to be a guide, uh, a tool towards initially education and training institutions to see if all uh, across the subject, so we are not talking about ICT education, but across the subject uh, told if these competences do appear and maybe can be put in the outcomes, in the learning outcomes to, uh, as an objective for their learning. And this is in fact the most important shortcut where you have the five domains of the competences with 21 competences that everybody has agreed about. And each of those uh, competences have uh, a definition, clarification, and has been, so you, oh sorry, uh, has been divided in three provisioncy levels. So from the description, what is it about, one has tried to develop uh, some questions that can be used for self-assessment. And what will happen now is that these questions will appear back in the Europass. So people, individuals can use those questions to position them on a certain provisioncy level for those competences. And you have then examples and so on. I'm not going into detail, you can find it. But uh, that it was useful showed, uh, was immediately showed by the uptake and the use. And uh, a few weeks ago, uh, this graph was uh, much easier to read. Now it's already very crowded, but we have nine member states uh, in the educational sector, formal educational sector, who are using this framework. Uh, to check what they have in their curricula and learning outcomes, uh, to complete it, or to say, okay, we are quite fine, or even to uh, say, look, uh, uh, the online uh, registration for citizenship is not so much an issue for us, we don't take that competence. But they use it as a framework uh, to check, to complete, and to talk uh, within uh, their systems and with teachers, uh, what does it really mean? What do we want our students uh, to know when they are leaving uh, secondary education, what does it mean to be digital savvy. But it went also further, that is that DG Justice has asked if they could use the framework uh, for developing a digital competence framework for citizens and consumers, and they are complementing it. And also uh, the, uh, the people around uh, the handicapped and disabled and the carers, uh, so the, the people in the health sector, are using this framework. It, it might be a very academic um, 
a structure, but it's not a, it, that, is, that is not really it. It is a framework uh, built uh, through uh, the ideas of stakeholders in order to use it concretely and to check uh, learning outcomes in training and education. Um, you see here, that's what I said, we have quite some endorsement and stakeholders who looked into it, pilots and embedding, and uh, Europass in May 2015, uh, it uh, was said to be end 2014, but it has now changed to uh, next month, will put it on, like for the languages, there will be a self-assessment tool to um, indicate which level you might have on uh, digital competences so that your employers uh, might have that as an indication. Why is this important? Well, digital competences is only one of the competences that is important in a skills portfolio. And in DG employment, we are looking into a much more global skills strategy whereby skills portfolio will be developed with employers and so on. So it's just one of the competences that are looked into and one of the, the, the next one will be, for example, on being entrepreneurial. Uh, so that is what I want to show you, how uh, in education and training, but not only in formal education, also in training, upskilling in, uh, and informal and non-formal, how important it is to grasp what we really mean to be digital competent, how can it be assessed, and then from there, uh, where can you find training courses to fill your gaps and so on. I think I... Thank you very much. Big applause for Liv. <laughs> Indeed, uh, uh, counting with a common framework for, of reference, uh, it's, uh, it's very important uh, for, for education. And uh, I don't know how many of you uh, were in, in the session uh, this morning, which took place in this room. Can you... Okay, so many. So, uh, because in that session it was discussed another framework, which is the uh, European Competence Framework, which is more intended for professionals. Uh, we from Telecentro Europe tried to make a clarification thinking on our members, but then we decided to, to, to make it public, uh, which is how to comp co compatibilize uh, the, the different frameworks. Uh, because there is a, a version of the e-competence framework which is intended for end users. And we find out uh, that the digital competence framework considers uh, digital competencies at large in their, in their complexity. Uh, and while the uh, e-competence framework for end users is more focused on, let's say, on instrumental use of, uh, of technology, and, and we, uh, but at the same time uh, allows to make, a, let's say, a more detailed measurement. So we try to, let's say, map uh, both and, and uh, come up with the conclusion that uh, some efforts from the European Commission side should be done uh, to, let's say, uh, present a, a, a unique harmonized picture for, for stakeholders working on. So I, I, I pledge for that. <laughs> uh, so uh, as you see, uh, we are uh, touching upon, uh, upon this topic uh, from different angles. Uh, it's a kind of puzzle uh, right now, but we will try to uh, let's say, uh, draw some conclusions at the end uh, that uh, uh, allows us uh, give, give a, uh, taking a look to the big, bigger picture. Uh, now I will invite uh, uh, the third speaker to, to join us. Uh, 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 it's, uh, sorry, one minute, because I have my notes here. So, uh, uh, Maxim Zhegorovs, right? Uh, it's a country led uh, for Accenture Latvia since 2006. And uh, apart from uh, leading uh, the company to be uh, the largest IT company in Latvia, uh, he uh, has also, uh, in interestingly, experienced as, as a teacher at Riga uh, Business School and Riga uh, Technical University. And uh, 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 you, you managed to combine both uh, passions, I think, uh, in a very interesting way, and it, it, it's also uh, 
an interesting case that you will uh, present us uh, uh, on how to tackle uh, this uh, this gap that uh, we have been speaking about. So please. Thank you. Um, or, do you need the? the yeah. Um, so I'm actually representing Accenture, and Accenture is one of those companies that you see advertising in their airports. And as all of us are flying, that you know those uh, different advertisings with the elephants uh, surfing uh, over the sea, right? But then, uh, as IT company in Latvia, uh, we are heavily dependent on the availability of skills uh, in the country. And at one point of time, I had a discussion in the Latvian university about what type of a curriculum do we have actually in, in the high schools. And um, it was about three years ago, and um, uh, at that point of time I understood that in, in Latvia only about 30 to 50 schools actually taught programming. And uh, out of around 380 uh, secondary schools. And of course, with this type of uh, availability of programming training, it was impossible to expect that we as a IT house, which employs today more than uh, 550 programmers, can have enough of, of that. Uh, on the other side, when we look at, for example, um, competitiveness surveys uh, done by the World Economic Forum, Latvia also lags in the amount of IT usage in the business. So from one side when you have IT professionals to the other side when you actually uh, looking at, let's say, normal, usual people which are not ICT professionals. The, the amount of IT skills there was also you know, not, not that great. And um, we kind of started to think about what can we do uh, and what could be our partners. Uh, because obviously there are lots of things happening on the government level, lots of the things happening on the EU level, but the speed of those things for us as a business was clearly not satisfactory either. And uh, we've came up with a project we call Start IT, and, and, and the idea is to start IT both in the sense of being employed in the ICT and learning the skills that can help you to be employed in the ICT on one side, but on the other side, use IT as something that can progress your career as a doctor or something that can progress your business, whatever that business is. Um, and then we looked at what types of things we could do uh, there. And that's a comparison that, that was um, inspirational for us. If we look at the amount of people we have in the country, the amount of IT professionals we have in the country, and for example compare ourselves to Finland, then this comparison is not that great. Uh, so what could we do uh, to improve that comparison? We launched uh, a series of IT schools and actually those IT schools are part of normal schools so we created curriculum that we pushed into uh, normal high schools and today we have actually a huge amount of schools as part of that program. To do that the strategy was to involve the teachers. Uh, we had a very interesting attempt to reform uh, Latvian IT education done by a very talented person, Robert Stilis, but it didn't really proceed well in the country because teach one of the reasons was that teachers were not on board uh, with the reform. So first thing was to involve them. Then we crowdsourced, uh, basically using a type of a Wikipedia method, we crowdsourced the actual training. So we took some of the best teachers in the country and we ask them to develop a course. Because if you look at the reality of life, then teachers, they get the contents that they get from books, from the standards, etc., etc. But actually, good teachers develop or deliver their own content. They don't deliver something just from the book. So we took that, uh, and then uh, as a firm, uh, we financed creation of that content into um, uh, uh, into a portal, uh, it's www.startit.lv. So all of the content that the, teach, the teachers created in that way is available there. For every uh, lesson we have uh, a video of that lesson, about 15 to 20 minute video that delivers the content of that lesson. We have a PowerPoint that gives the teacher the ability to take uh, the lesson that we developed 
redesign it in his or her own way and then deliver in the way the teacher wants it to deliver. There is a set of tests that the teacher can use. So that's something that is absolutely ready for any teacher to use. That naturally also decreases the barrier between a teacher that aspires to improve and the actual class because the teacher does not have to invest as much himself or herself to be able to deliver that. Also to enable that, we actually trained around 450 teachers by now. And if you think that in Latvia there are around 350 secondary schools, that's a huge amount of teachers right, that we trained. And that's only two years. Then next thing here is wide coalition because we were looking for a formula where we could minimize the amount of people involved, the amount of organizations involved, uh, so that there is minimal amount of, let's say, useless discussion and there is maximum amount of action. Um, and I will touch upon that uh, in a second. So we delivered about 120 schools. Uh, then the partners that joined uh, the, the effort from the very beginning was Riga Technical University. We have a representative here. Uh, it is uh, Latvian I Informatics Teacher Association. Lisa, we have a representative here. Uh, it's Pirma uh, Vals um, uh, uh Makite uh, as a company. We also, and then uh, as one of the next steps, we wanted to make sure that our competitors on the recruiting market also join up because as a national effort this does not make sense if it is coming also only from one IT company and the first one to join up was Exigen and the representative was also here, thank you for that. Uh, we did invest a, a quite huge amount of money uh, uh, for a private entity to do, uh, it's around 100,000 uh, euro, not including the time that, that we've invested, this was pure cash, um, right? And then if we look uh, at our next steps, then we're looking at uh, including the uh, training in robotics, we're looking to include informatics, uh, and we have also strengthened, uh, strengthened the national competition, which in Latvia produces pretty good results. So Latvia is actually at the top, of, um, of the ratings if you take the, uh, the Olympiads, right? Yeah. So that's all from my side, thank you. Thank you very much. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so uh, at, at this point of time, I, I would like to uh, open a round of uh, uh, questions and answers coming, uh, well, from, from the audience, I, I would invite uh, especially youngsters uh, who are a lot in this room to, to, to formulate questions because uh, you are those who can formulate those questions which are more provocative for the, for the speakers, I think. Um, so, any question coming from the audience so far? Okay, uh, I, I have a couple of questions but for, for, for the panelists before we move uh, to, to, to the other speakers. Um, I wanted to, to ask Mark uh, about uh, uh, all these nice initiatives that are already uh, in place. Uh, which are the challenges to scale them up and to, let's say, uh, spread them all over Europe? Which are especially the challenges that uh, national ministries are, are uh, facing to, to do so, to go, let's say, to speed up the process. Yeah, in fact, the mainstreaming issues is, is one of the, of the key challenges we all have when we, we intervene on innovative approaches. And uh, I would say part of the situation is we, we ask all our teachers to, to struggle to, to prepare the students to face uh, what is needed for the 21st century, while all our education systems, and there is no criticism, that's a reality, have been designed uh, within the 19th century. And then there is a big gap on it. And we have to, to, the challenge is to move from innovative teachers, 
and we have a, a lot of innovative teachers doing plenty of good things, to the concept of innovative schools. And that certainly is a challenge that we all have in, in the formal systems, where we have to move from the innovative, isolated teacher to a global school approach. But for the time being, the issue is head of schools are not prepared for that because they are all trained to do more with less. And that's more or less how they are trained and what they, they expected to do. So looking at the mainstreaming issues, uh, generally how it works is it has to come from the top, which means prescriptive decisions, and then it goes down, and then the ministry says to schools, wh whatever the system is, fully centralized, decentralized, that's more or less how it goes. Now things have to change. Mainstreaming comes from a large adoption at the bottom up from teachers. And the, the challenge we have is to, to combine a type of large scale adoption from teachers, which means that, as it has been expressed by, by one of the speakers today, we have to associate teachers. They have to be co-constructor of all initiatives. And at some stage, we also must have the political decisions to intervene to say, if we change things, there is no way backwards. So which means it's a mix of top-down approaches and bottom-up approaches. But it takes time. It takes time. And one of the most important elements, if one wants to scale up all what is going on, we must give time to teachers to do it. And we must recognize teachers on all the innovative activities they are doing. Uh, any question from, from the audience right now? Okay. You're a little bit shy. <laughs> uh, so, um, Liv and uh, also Maxim, I, I would like to uh, point out another element that I think is on the table rounding, which is uh, about collaboration. You indeed mentioned a coalition, uh, and uh, you, uh, you Liv mentioned uh, the efforts made in the training sector, let's say, aside to the formal education. So, how can we make uh, those worlds collaborate more? I mean, Formal education, non-formal education, industry-led training. That's, of course, a $1 million uh, question. Huh? Um, it's, of course, um, a must. That is that you have to collaborate, but that's not enough. I think that you have uh, to find the same language in order to talk to each other and to, uh, in a way, to, to put that language then in instruments where you can keep the link or that collaboration ongoing. And I think that in the ICT sector that is especially very um, important, uh, even with a lot of awareness raising days, uh, with platform set up, I think that the, if an employer or the industry talks to the education people, you have immediately a full uh, two worlds uh, picture. And uh, that uh, is, has not really changed and uh, it has to do a lot like uh, as we had in the introduction that uh, education is asked to do a lot and education is going to solve uh, all the problems and the mismatches and it has to provide supply and the needs and it has to know about the needs. But education does not only see it as being ready for employability, it, it's looking also to uh, knowledge and uh, the, the being of the person and so on. The language that is used when we have those uh, platform conversations between in those two worlds is often very difficult to convey and that's why I plea to have much more brokers who are able to bring those two worlds more together and to have instruments 
to have those two worlds more together. And of course, the education world is very complex. It's not only formal education, there's a lot of training also in ICT uh, by companies. Uh, you have to bring that all together uh, and to, to, to find the instruments to stimulate it. But my experience, and I look uh, to Marek, I think the, the exchange is not going easy. Yeah? Especially if you then go to the real, the people who really have to do it, the teachers, their way of talking about these things are so different from what the industry is expecting. And I think the notion of what I have called learning outcomes, so not to be busy with exams, and but to try to identify what do you want now your student when it come when coming out of upper sen, uh, secondary education, what do you want that person to know in these skills, competences, and knowledge to try to describe it well gives immediately an, an impact on how you assess it. If you are well describing the learning outcomes, you have an impact on assessment, on another way of assessment, but also immediately an impact on the, on the curricula and on the way you are teaching it. So for me, fundamentally, is to have education uh, go competence or competence-based to talk in terms of competence Competences. And there the companies and the industry do understand that. And if we then can bring the competences and bridge that with qualifications, we are already a way further. But I see Marek uh, reacting. Yeah. Well, I guess in this case, Latvia is a, is a great example because, I mean, this program, uh, all of the contents is actually absolutely certified by the state. And there is a full connection between the, the state uh, institutions, the schools, which are partially uh, between state governed and district governed, and then the industry. I mean, just to give you an example, every IT teacher that teaches programming has a possibility of taking up a mentor from the industry. So that's a real programmer, uh, typically a very young person that gives his phone number and whom you can call if your code doesn't compile. Right, so, but it is, uh, I guess, pretty unique on uh, on kind of a European global level to reach this type of an integration. I guess in IT industry, it is pretty natural for us to work like that, and IT industry has given a lot of examples of uh, helping the society through what we call open source collaboration, when instead of asking uh, companies to pay for something. The IT industry has come with open source things like Linux and uh, Apache servers that fuel all of the internet. So for us as people, for us as a profession, as a culture, it is very, very natural. And that's what we wanted to give also to the society in the form of an example here. Right. Because it is open sourced as a contents, it is available to teachers, but you have also to invest in them. You have to give them time and then give them training. On the other side, uh, the relationship between society and, uh, let's say, government employed people is something that has to change too. Because what we see is often society says, you know, we want this change to happen faster. And then government employed individuals say that we want to make sure that our social rights are protected. Right? So that's, that's a challenge, I guess, we are still moving on to, to, to resolve. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to, to comment a little bit on the competence-based approach because uh, more or less uh, our, our education systems are based around three main pillars. So we, we have the first pillar is the curriculum. And there's a lot of things going on in the curriculum. Uh, the second pillar is more on the pedagogy, the teachers, the pedagogical practice. And we work quite a lot on these two pillars. We develop competence-based approach. But there is a last pillar where we do more or less nothing, which is the assessment. So, so, which means all what we are going to do will impact on these two first pillars while we keep traditional assessment models. And if we want to move forward, one of the major aspects which has to be looked at is how are we going to change the way we assess the competence? 
do we have to keep the same assessment models or the way we teach collaborative learning, inquiry science-based education, when we try to, to, to integrate more discovery-based approach and so on, does it mean that we have to keep the same traditional assessment models that we used for the last century? And that's certainly one element which has also to be, to be considered if one wants to move forward. And this can be also part of uh, the common language that uh, Lee was claiming for, no? uh, the common language that education and, and other actors can, can speak to, together for collaboration. Uh, I will uh, invite to, to join us uh, uh, Adel, uh, who is uh, uh, f uh, coordinating uh, a, a very interesting uh, grassroots program. Uh, he comes from one of our members in Sweden, and uh, it's an example of uh, non-formal education where uh, young people are uh, making something useful with their digital competencies. Uh, for society, and uh, it's also activating other uh, competencies. So, please, Adel, explain us your example. Yes, uh, are we gonna? Uh, we have huge challenges in Europe, and I will mention some of them for you. There are three huge groups. Uh, that are outside the ICT world. Seniors who are not like interested in learning how, they use, how to use e-services. And we have immigrants uh, who have so much new in their new country uh, and uh, new e-services. And then we have unemployed people. Uh, their competence aren't needed anymore and they have to get new competence to become more employable. ETGuide has, a successful uh, has developed a successful model that can help to come over these challenges. At the first phase, it's three phases. At the first phase, we choose a number of young immigrants that have been in Sweden for about two years, and they are going to start high school. With some supervision, these young immigrants start teach seniors basic ICT and different e-services at our meeting points like libraries and elderly cares. By creating these meetings between these two target groups, we can solve two social problems here. The immigrants get the social inclusion and the seniors get the digital inclusion, win-win. These young people can speak other languages too, because their mother language is not Swedish. So why not letting them to learn adult immigrants? So at the phase two, the ET guide have been teaching, after that, the ET guides have been teaching seniors for about one year. They start holding course, courses for the adult immigrants and teaching them the, the Swedish e-services. I will tell you our five keywords which describe the benefits of this model. Participation. The ETGAS feeling that they can benefit the community and the seniors start using social media and getting active in different forums in the internet. Leadership. Immigrants becoming positive role models and transfer their knowledge to their friends and families. And at the same, for the seniors, they can be positive role models for their friends. We have the motivation. They gain more experience and get more confidence and devel develop as a person. And of course, the language development, they improve the communication skills by teaching e-skills to the seniors. And of course, the seniors, they get language development, like Googling words, Snapchatting picture, new words for them too. And then we have belonging. 
belonging to a community ET guide. We can connect this group of young people to the ICT companies and have conferences where they learn the new technologies and e-services. Then they can transfer it to the seniors at the meeting points. After these two phases, the ET guys have developed their language and gained more confidence, and the seniors and adult immigrants improved their ICT. So at phase three, ET guides can start learning unemployed people, ICT, like the basic ICT, like attaching documents, sending mails, using Word, and more. Of course, yes. And I can mention that we newly become the member of Telecenter Europe. It's a great organization. Uh, and of course, we have had won uh, prizes like Voice of the Swedish People. So we presented this model, model for Nelly Cruz, Vice President and Digital Agenda Commissioner. We want to bring this model to whole Europe so more countries can get benefit of this. You want to know more uh, or collaborate with us, please contact me or the operation manager, Gunilla Landberg. Thank you. Thank you, Adel. Please sit down here. So our next uh, uh, panelist is Anita sorgen uh, I say it correctly, more or less. <laughs> She's an education program manager at Microsoft uh, Latvia and uh, uh, working the partners in learning team, uh, dealing with the students, educators, and educational leaders about technology to enhance learning, so quite to the point. And uh, uh, she has uh, a very varied experience working from uh, together with small NGOs to uh, multi-million uh, international infrastructure development in initiatives. So uh, she will present us another uh, good example coming from the industry that then will be complemented by uh, another panelist who is uh, a teacher of it. So, Anita. Thank you, Gabriel. We all know that uh, there is a great lack of programmers and IT professionals, both in Europe and globally. And on the other hand, we know that there is a huge unemployment rate among the youth as well. And that's that dilemma. And that's why Microsoft as a company both globally and in Latvia, invest in education. And that's why I'm happy to be part of this company who cares about education. Beside the global initiatives that uh, Alexa Joyce mentioned in the morning during the keynote session, I want to point out also some initiatives that we are driving here in Latvia. Uh, virtual University is an online course for teachers, for all subject teachers, how to implement and how to use Microsoft technology in their classrooms, in, the, in their lessons. We also have a program for school leaders to help them to uh, implement innovations in their schools. We have used Spark activities, uh, emphasizing use, how they can get ready for the job market programming school. That was the initiative we started last year. We piloted and I should say that was a huge success. The audience was 7th till ninth graders and we had 10 times more applications than we were able to accept. Uh, and the great value of this project was that um, some people, some kids really enjoyed coding. They found that's their thing. And the others liked web design or multimedia much more. And that's the great success myself, I think so. Uh, this was the first year we started uh, to participate in Hour of Code or the Coding Week to explain the algorithmical type of thinking for the small kids. And finally, 
ready for tomorrow. This is the project I want to tell you a bit more today. Um, this project started uh, from two sides almost simultaneously. At first, uh, two teachers from different schools came to me and asked that they wished to have the tablet PCs in their schools. And shortly after, our state president visited Redmond and during the meeting with vice president of Microsoft, they agreed that Latvia will invest and Latvia will work to integrate ICT in education in much deeper way. And Microsoft in this case just worked as an enabler of this project. So, in a nutshell, initially we aimed to have three classrooms uh, to test how ICT can be integrated into the all stages of education, how it can be used deeply in all the subjects, in all the lessons in everyday life. Now we have five schools and we want to test exactly which methods work best for the primary school children, which ones from the secondary school, and which for the higher school students. The all schools are in different regions. Uh, we provided with the tablet PCs and a 3D printer in a school, and great emphasis is put in a teacher training, because without a teacher, it can't be done. We chose and asked the enthusiastic teachers to provide and to show an example to other teachers how to do it. Digital learning materials and project monitoring and evaluation is a very important part as well. So we need to assess how uh, this project can be done and which is the best way how to integrate the ICT in the schools. This project is more for the 21st century skill development for the kids and not so much focus on the programming. Yes, indeed. Also, this project had its first step. Uh, and this first step was the great wish to have kids more interesting lessons, to provide them with the skills that they will need in their future, that they will need also today, actually. And we had some challenges as well. There were some problems in infrastructure. It was not easy to find the funding for it. There were some resistance in the teacher's audience. And uh, so overall, also in the policy, we had on the, in the policy makers, and in ministry and in municipalities, we do have some challenges to prove that 21st century skills and also the digital skills is a very important part that kids need to learn now, not tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. But nevertheless, this is a very exciting journey, I should say, and uh, for sure there is much more benefits than the challenges we had. And the first, of course, is happy kids that enjoy the process and that they will learn the skills they deserve to learn. The understanding that uh, smartphones and tablets can be used for work as well as for entertainment. The teacher professional development, the teachers more qualified, more professional teachers is really the value we see in the society. And of course, the monitoring process I already mentioned, we created the criteria and the tool with which we will be able to measure the success and to make some um, conclusions and advices what should be done and how it can be done in the schools to make the ICT the part of the everyday teaching and learning process. And we do like, like to scale this project out, not only to other Latvian schools, we'd like to share the, it's okay, uh, we'd like to share this, uh, our findings also with the other schools, both through our network or the other way. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Nita. Please sit down here. Uh, please take take a seat here in, for 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 the questions. So now, uh, Edgar Bayarun's uh, he's a, a, a teacher involved in this uh, uh, nice initiative. He's uh, currently a teacher of history and social sciences and physics as as well in the secondary school. And uh, he's uh, using actively uh, all this uh, technology in his classes. So please uh, tell us how are you, are you dealing with. OK. <clears throat> and I was asked to talk about challenges for teachers to become uh, proficient uh, in the use of technologies for learning. So I'll try to provoke, and I'll try to be brief with my 24 slides. So. Uh, yes, as it was told, I'm teacher of uh, physics, history, and social class. So I don't teach ICT, I don't teach computer, but I use extensively lots of technologies in my class. And uh, I hope I still look young, and I have been in school for four years, so some of you might ask, whoa, he, he doesn't have a combined experience of 200 years in a school, so how can he speak? But uh, within past year, or so, I've taught around 350 teachers, to be precise, 392 since last weekend on how to use ICT in a classroom, what, how to use technologies. And not computer teachers, but history teachers, uh, different uh, humanity teachers. Uh, so from there, let's start with a bit of vision and uh, vision of future. And we know that uh, this picture is probably old, or allegedly we have put man on the moon, but reality is that teacher, uh, kids I teach in a sixth grade, they will enter the labor market in 2025. So by that time, the society will be changed, especially if we believe Microsoft vision, uh, which vision of future, and the whole society will be different, and we need to pack them with some skills. And not only uh, like coding skills, but use of ICT in much broader sense. So we talk a lot about 21st century skills and different concepts, and there was a great idea of packing it all in. But the obvious elephant is a in a room is, can we do 21st century skills with 20th century methods? Uh, obviously not. And if you look on a, a 21st century skills as a box or set, the question is not only what's inside, but who and how will deliver them. Who will be those teachers? And I guess it's not only computer teachers. So let's go down to some more practical things from everyday level. And obviously, we have some sort of uh, hostage situation now. Because on the one hand, we have ICT used in a classroom, and we have lots of initiatives for computer teachers, coding, and using ICT more proficiently. But what about the rest of the teachers? And what do they do in their classrooms, and how they will use the technologies? Uh, so the question I ask a lot to myself is, do we have enough? Do we have enough training? Do we have enough technologies? Do we have enough access? And on one hand, I'm a teacher, so I'll scream, no, we need more, we need more of everything. But if we look a bit closer to the problem, then there's a few of the things in the universe, like wealth, drinking water, resources, which aren't distributed equally. We have a lot of good things going around, and still we lack access to them. Here's a few examples. In Latvia, we're very proud about high-speed internet and, and, and everything like that. And if you go down outside in a park, most of the parks in Riga has high-speed internet connection, free Wi-Fi. Now, when it comes down to schools, mostly if you try to set 25 tablets in one cl classroom, it looks like we might have a problem here. And the question of infrastructure in a school to be ready and if we, we talk broader about bring your own device to school, then we lack in infrastructure. Now, the technology and access to technology, and I teach uh, physics as well, and a few years ago there was a huge STEM project providing a lot of, lot of uh, interactive whiteboards, a lot of technologies, mobile computer class, 
different, uh, different lab equipment, etc., etc., some of which is actually used by CSI. And what is for history teachers there? And I always like to compare this in a short analogy. If I would have the same investment in history teaching, there would probably be a stable next to my school, an armory, so I could dress up once a year when I teach about crusades. So, and give a visible example. So this is another thing where we see unequal distribution. And then when it comes to a training, there's a lot of initiatives, there's a lot of good things accessible for teacher, but it's like a puzzle. It's thrown around everywhere, and teacher actually lacks some, some simple steps, some guide, guidelines on how to become a proficient teacher and user of ICT. And then the last, one of the biggest issues is back to the future problem, because by the time when decisions are made, they're most likely already outdated. So when I started working in a school, uh, four years ago I was asked to radio station and they were asking me about tablets in school and I said when it will be done it will probably already be too, too far behind and now in my class thanks to Microsoft Project I'm having technologies and I, and I can work with kids with tablets but on a bigger scale do we have tablets in every school? Most likely no. Do we have a training in every school? Most likely no. And by the time when we decide which technologies to use and how to use them, those probably will be outdated. And as the three final conclusions out of this which I can take, the first one and the most important one, if kids has access and teachers has a training and access to technologies, the sky is the limit. So here's one example. This is here. Uh, Maybe you can recognize the building. Yeah, so this is the building, this one. So this is 3D printed model. And obviously 3D printing is nothing new. When it comes to 3D printing in schools, it's something new. And the most inspiring thing is that the model was actually builded by 14-year-old kid. So this is one of examples that we can actually go much more beyond into a future. Now the second thing I know for sure is by the time when we will sort of get into it and, 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 and change and adapt, the technology will grow so rapidly into the future that I as a teacher with a tablet will be outdated and kids in the breaks will sit around in hollow lenses building their own realities or sitting in their smart pen pants and doing something else. So that's the obvious thing. We have, to, we have to catch up. The initiatives must be faster and must be better targeted. Now the third conclusion I can tell from my side is while we hesitate to bring in technologies, to bring in training for the teachers and to change things, we're losing generations and kids are being hurt because they will lack the skills. So if we don't teach those kids in the sixth and seventh grade now to have a good, decent skills of using ICT, when they finish the school in 2025, they will be amongst, among those who might had a job in ICT and they didn't. So to sum it all up, is there any good news? Well, by my experience out of those 392 teachers I taught within the past year, around 60% of them are actually ready to change, ready to start using ICT in their classroom with their kids. If they had access to technology, decent training and mentoring. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we are coming to the last uh, panelist, uh, Torben Aver, uh, is Head of Public Affairs in the Baltic Devel Development Forum, and uh, uh, he's expert in different kinds of 
uh, collaboration, public-private, regional collaboration, cross-border cooperation, and uh, the Baltic Sea region, uh, uh, the, 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 the region he has explored more, uh, he's, uh, he has been running a couple of studies that I found very interesting to know before. And uh, he will speak about the challenge, the challenge of meeting future e-skill demands in the Nordic Baltic ICT hub. Thank you, Gabriel, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, I represent two bodies today. One is Baltic Development Forum, which you may never have heard of, uh, but it's a network, what we call a high-level network even, for public and private collaboration and dialogue in the Baltic Sea region around topics linked to growth and competitiveness. We, we are a platform where we bring together politi politicians, business um, people, and um, what we else do is also that, oh, sorry, what I am representing also today is uh, something we built or established last year together with Microsoft, uh, one of our strategic partners, and it's uh, what should develop into an ICT think tank for the Baltic Sea region, and we call it uh, rather ambitious, we call it the top of digital Europe. It actually refers to the fact that um, this part of Europe is in, in some senses referred to as the top of Europe, not just ge geographically, but also because this region is, is doing very well uh, when it comes to economic growth. Um, we have, I have a brief uh, little leaflet here that you will find uh, downstairs somewhere if you're interested, and we launched the website uh, just yesterday, tolerdilson.eu. Uh, the thinking behind this initiative is that, uh, as we also heard uh, from Alexa this morning, that um, this part of the world is, is not just doing very well in the digital senses. I mean, we're one of the, one of the ICT hubs globally, basically, um, but also um, sort of confirmed that by the fact that a company like Microsoft has invested huge amounts in this part of, of the world. Um, and, I mean, we're all familiar with the latest, I guess, the latest figures from DESY, the European Index, and here we have picked the, the Baltic Sea countries, um, at least most of them, um, or those that are members of the European Union, and here you can see that uh, countries like, well, it's traditionally the Nordic countries also when it comes to World, World Economic Forum indexes that are very high have very high scores in these um, in these areas when it comes to uh, digital readiness, etc., uh, use of internet, digital public services, uh, e-government. Of course, uh, also Estonia is very strong in these areas, uh, whereas uh, countries like uh, sorry uh, Latvia and Poland are a bit lagging behind the EU average. Um, but we're not just we're not only good in the digital area, we also have open, e open economies, we have very, very well-educated workforces, and we also, in this part of Europe, have long traditions for cross-border corporations, informal networks across borders, and not least, also public-private dialogue in, in many topics between society and, and, um, and industry. But of course, we're also facing a tough uh, international competition and um, the question and also the thinking behind the the ICT think tank somewhat into Europe is how can we how can we stay on top so to speak how can we maintain how can we stay competitive but not just that also how can we inspire the rest of Europe with good examples the European Commission used to or at least in many contexts they have been looking at the Baltic Sea region for a, as a front runner and someone that could inspire the rest of Europe. So we uh, expect it to deliver some concrete cases, some good examples, maybe even show the shortcuts to the digital single market, and uh, that's what we think we can do. Uh, we should not, of course, duplicate what's going on in the European uh, digital agenda process. Uh, we should learn from it, but also, of course, we should as I said, inspire the, the other way around and, and show what, what we can do. 
Looking a bit more specific, yeah, uh, as I said to you, Gabriel, I'm not an expert in, I'm not in education and not in, in ICT, but uh, at least I can see from these figures where we picked out uh, on the human capital, the competence part, the ICT skills part of the DC index. They can see that also here we are pretty good. Um, we are somehow very good prepared to meet the new challenges when it comes to e-skills. But this also triggered um, us to ask a couple of questions. And one thing is, what does the e-skill situation really look now, look at, or look, oh, sorry, what does the, how does the e-skill situation really look in the Baltic Sea region? Um, and what are the key challenges that we're facing here? Are they different? And how can we uh, meet them? But also, do we have, uh, what, what are the views of the employers and the um, educators on what kind of skills are the most important in, in the future? So what we did is that, um, and here it comes back to the first slide, um, we, we're preparing a short discussion paper on these topics. We call it Coding the Future. Um, and it will include a short survey that we made um, where we got in touch with um, companies, startups, universities, and venture capitalists in these five Baltic Sea region countries. Um, and it's, it's not, this is not science, of course. It's only a snapshot showing some tendencies and some indications on the relationships between these, these uh, partners. The first tendency is that there seems to be a general agreement between industry and education that coding should start at, a, as you can see here, pretty early age. Uh, and I've learned today and, and yesterday that this is something that has been intensely discussed. What, uh, how should you deal with this topic in primary school? And um, it, we also learned that countries like Finland, Estonia, seem to be front runners, uh, pioneers in this area but also that uh, Latvia was coming up now, and uh, Norway is on the way, so it seems that there's a lot of things going on here, whereas Denmark and Sweden seem to be uh, not as willing to, to take up this perspective um, as they maybe should be. The second tendency is that um, educational institutions, they value social and cross-cultural skills significantly lower than for example, startups and ICT companies, um, because they increasingly look for individuals with a broader skill set uh, and not just people with deep technical skills, but more, as it was also said earlier today, people with, who could be sort of more extroverted, at least with more comprehensive uh, competences in this area. And the third finding, which may not be very surprising, is that uh, um, industry, especially startups, they put more emphasis on, uh, on uh, skills in new technologies such as mobile apps and, and cloud computing, which is not the priority necessarily in the, at the universities. And that, of course, is, is due to the fact that universities, they educate for a long term, uh, for the long term uh, uh, skills, and not necessarily are able to cope with the, the uh, very speedy technological development. So what this leads to for us is that, um, well, to put it brief, at least there are, this confirms some of the skill challenges that seems also to be discussed um, all over Europe, that um, we should empower teachers and school leaders to leverage programming and these girls in, at the primary schools in very early age. And it was interesting to hear yesterday at the round table that in Norway the teachers are actually doing this from the bottom up. That was a grassroots moving coming up uh, in this area in Norway. That's very interesting, I think. The second challenge is that um, we should maybe look more into the knowledge value chains in this area. And it's all the way through uh, from primary school to, to all over and to labor market and everywhere where, where sort of education and employment uh, meet each other. And the most, I think maybe the most important thing is that we should not just promote collaboration between educators and employers at all levels, but we should also identify the most tangible and the good stories in this area. 
And that's what we have sort of been uh, trying to look at. And there seem to be a lot of good cases from the Grand Coalition, from the country reports that was published last year, last year um, at the uh, Commission's webpage. Uh, and there are a lot of, seem to be a lot of good stories, a lot of interesting experiments going on over, all over uh, Europe. What, what we didn't really find, maybe we haven't digged deep enough, is uh, good stories where, edu where, for example, universities and industry are having a direct current dialogue. For example, in Denmark, we have, uh, as you also probably have, advisory boards at the university, at the ICT faculties, uh, where industry is invited to come and, and currently have a dialogue with the, how can we actually um, do this together, but uh, it doesn't seem to work the way it's, it's meant to. So, uh, and also I noticed that uh, the Grand Coalition, a uh, very interesting map that there are uh, national coalitions set up in, I think it was Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. But where are the other countries in the Baltic Sea region? I mean, we're very good at the digital competences, but why don't we, why don't we establish national coalitions in this area? Is that why we, we just um, want to stay alone with this? I was also a bit surprised to when the Danish government, to give another example, uh, Denmark is, has a high score in this area, and Denmark recently launched um, what we call, or the, what the government calls a, a growth plan, national growth plan for the ICT sector, how the ICT sector can contribute to growth. And that's growth plan. Uh, I asked them, why, what, are, you going to, are you planning to translate this into English or give an English summary? No, that's not in the plan. Uh, that's not the intention. <laughs> um, and that, I think, gives, uh, gives me the reflection that uh, we're not good enough thinking or working cross border in this area. There's a lot of good initiatives, that's what I learned today and, and yesterday in this area. Um, but uh, I think we should be better in, uh, in having the dialogue, not just across sectors, but also across the borders. Uh, so I think that's my brief input from here. And this is uh, the top of Deals Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we are sharp on time uh, to finish this session. Unfortunately, please sit uh, sit down uh, for a minute. Maybe we can just uh, uh, go very quickly through one or two questions from from your side. If you have any question for the panelists, yes, please. A couple of, of months ago, I was also. Um, at one of your conferences in Brussels, and there were presented some figures that uh, demand for uh, coding skills, uh, typically on a bachelor, bachelor level, ICT skills was declining, and the demand for the higher education skills, master in business engineering, was increasing. My question to you is, are you sure that you are, that you are having the right strategy? Because it seems that you're all focusing on uh, coding skills. Who wants to respond to this question? I'm not sure I understood the question. So you're, uh, you're saying that the research is showing that the amount of skill, amount, the demand should increase. And are we sure about that? To focus on just coding. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yes. If. I will answer already partly. I don't think that the stress is on coding. I think that uh, if you listen to the educational and training, if you look to teacher education, professional development, what is behind all the messages is that you really need to be able to use ICT for something. It is a tool that you use to bring in innovative teaching, uh, to do things in another way that you can't do with, so to improve uh, the way you teach. 
and to pass on what we heard 21st century skills uh, to let to use the ICT as a tool to let uh, students be able to think to learn to be critical to take initiative and so on I think the larger message if you look to education and not to pure ICT education it is to use ICT as a tool to innovate to modernize the teaching and the education in order that all skills that are being acquired are fitting better with the society that we are awaiting because we might not know what kind of jobs are there in 2030 and still they need to be flexible enough and have that basis to do. I think that is the major message. When you hear that a lot of member states do to up coding, it is because uh, coding is not always programming. We haven't touched about uh, the, the, the philosophy and the rationale behind coding, but the, the interesting coding came from a similar approach that coding offers uh, uh, students and learners a kind of language and, and frame to better function in a digital society. Now, programming is part of that. So when I uh, try to explain you, we have been looking into a digital competence framework for citizens, it has the same message. It's not pure about functional ICT skills. You are not all becoming an ICT professional, but students at least should be able to learn to work, to use e-commerce, uh, uh, e-health, to really be in a digital society. And for those then that are more interested, they should have the basis, and coding is the basis, in order to go to an ICT career or a STEM career uh, and to do that. So that, I think, is more the message, but coding came up as being important for that basis. And that's not there now. Um, um, so first of all, we're focusing here on high school, right? Um, in high school, uh, coding is probably something like second writing. So if in Europe we taught everybody to read and write, actually in 19th century only, so coding is the analog for that in the 21st century. So the people who will learn to code, they will become all types of different professionals, right? But we don't want to have doctors that do not understand how the machine works. Because the machine has come to help the doctors already. So when we look today at the diagnosis process, we do have the machines that are becoming a very important part even of the diagnosis process, which was not imaginable even three years ago, right? Second thing is that in Europe, there is a bit of a tendency that we start employing people after master's degree in computing, right? So all of the more simple things that are being done uh, offshore, Right? So there is a bit of a tendency that we want people to complete full education, kind of, and then we as IT firms employ them later. But there is now also a counter tendency that we actually start employing them earlier, right? because some of these offshore trends have stabilized and we see an opportunity to take up people earlier. Right? But the main thing is that this is secondary education. Everybody should be able to code, everybody. Mark, please. If I, if I may. Yeah. I think the beauty is in the difference and not all of the people or not all of the kids will be musicians and in the same way not all will be the coders or the programmers and I think that the first or the basic level is this 21st century skills and that we as the Microsoft also very much put focus on and the digital skills is part of that and they need to know it and in the programming and uh, if we take into account the small kids the basics of programming is actually the algorithmical thinking the, that the certain things lead to the certain result and this way of thinking will help in any industry. Uh, I would not disagree with, with your question because the difficulty we have with this type of uh, awareness campaign is we try to use the same tools to solve different issues. 
And in fact, we have two different types of issues. We have the first issue is a basic level of IT literacy or IT competence that any young student should have. And there is another issue where we lack very high skilled IT professionals. But the way to tackle that, and that's part of the mistake in the communication on we do, we try to put everything in the same box, but it doesn't work because the tools to be used in order to guarantee a basic level of competence in IT for everybody, and the other way in order to look more and focus more on f or preparing and training very high level IT professionals is completely different. And when we surveyed our ministries on coding, that's not only programming, and that's the problem is, if you look at, and, and the way curriculum are designed is a little bit complicated, but coding is more logical reasoning, how to address problem solving as well. So which means that's only to provide the basic level of competence that one should have as well as writing, calculating, and so on. It, as Liva mentioned, uh, it doesn't mean that all will become very highly skilled IT professionals in the future. So that's the difference between the the basic competence, which requires specific actions, whereas we have also to look at what should be the more approach to be, to be looked at for highly skilled people that also industry needs. Thank you very much uh, for, well, all the panelists, a big applause for them. Thank you for joining us in this session. Uh, you are now invited to join uh, the, the, the coffee area and the boost area uh, for a break. And well, uh, then there will be a, a final session, I think, in plenary. Thank you. <laughs>